Hello there, sword friends. I have a quick sword log vlog log type video to share with you about an experience related to swords. One that I had at the Oakshot Institute at a lecture that was given about the hilt of swords. Basically, the evolution of hilts uh, in some of the medieval periods and as they relate anyway to, to some European style swords. There were five historic examples presented and the lecture was only about an hour and it covered things from kind of general overly crazy sword nerdery all the way to really basic stuff. I granted presented that spectrum kind of on the reverse end. I tend to get pretty heavy-handed in the sword nerdery, but it was presented in such a way that if you didn't really have any scholarly understanding of swords, not to say that I do, but if, you're, if your enthusiasm around sword wasn't beyond you think they look cool and wanted to learn more about them, there was some information that was very digestible in the lecture. As such, with an hour and that kind of spread of, of knowledge, there's not a whole lot that you can get nitty-gritty about. But what I found particularly fascinating about the lecture was that afterwards, there's a chance to handle and photograph and film all of these types of swords to feel how they are, you know, basically what, what they're supposed to feel like in your hand, and the experience is illuminating. Now, I have a lot of swords, and it's easy for me to hold antique Indian swords and antique Japanese swords and antique Filipino swords, but I really haven't had a whole lot of experience handling antique medieval European weaponry. The I just haven't haven't had a lot of opportunity to do so. They're they're harder to find, and well, that's a subject for a different video. Any anyway, I got I got to handle some of those swords, and it was certainly enlightening and much appreciated. I'm very glad that I went. Anyway, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each one of the swords, and not necessarily the swords, their history, or any of that. Hopefully the Oakshot Institute has some information about that, but just some interesting things that I found about each one, in particular things that were observations I made as, as a guy that primarily collects modern reproductions, whether they be made in China or elsewhere. Uh, just different things about the construction and things like, I suppose, things that drew my attention and that I found interesting are what I'm gonna share. Rather than the components of the lecture, I won't steal the Oakshot Institute's thunder, though, as a shout out to the Oakshot Institute, if you're interested, I will include links in the description down below so that you can uh, peruse their upcoming events. If you're so interested in going, I would certainly encourage. If you enjoy their scholarly pursuits, their articles, their blogs, they have a donation page, and I would certainly encourage you to contribute if you are interested in doing so. They certainly provided me with an interesting experience and one that I found incredibly valuable as a sword enthusiast, as a collector, as a as a guy that trades stuff, as a guy that has custom works made in, in the in the realm of, you know, people that I suppose make to order type products. Um, as, as a just general sword nerd, holding an antique medieval sword was really, really, really quite fun for me and interesting to compare and contrast uh, how they feel in the hand compared to some of the other bits in my collection. Anyway, I'll stop rambling about that. Links in the description down below. I'm going to talk about the individual swords and uh, tell you what I found interesting. So there were five swords presented, and the first one that I got a chance to really get a close look at was this Scottish broadsword. And I don't know a whole lot about the typology of the blade, only that this is a more refined example, perhaps not the most, but certainly likely owned by somebody wealthy and, and well-trained, or at least so it was proposed in the lecture. The things that I found really more interesting about this sword than perhaps others were the shape appeared very similar to like a Viking era sword, and that was a contrast that was made in the lecture. I found that to be really quite fascinating that the, the swords really, you know, start at this kind of Viking, well they don't start at the Viking era, but it's a long time ago. A thousand years ago there's this Viking era and you see swords that look like this and then they evolve and change shape and compete with mail and all that and then sometime uh, when the Scottish backsword was made or broadsword was made it was, you know, it reverts back to this very, very, very classical shape. Anyway, uh, very thin, very agile, and it had these markings on it. Now, if I were to see a mass production sword made with this kind of engraving in the blade, it, it looks cartoonish and unrefined to, to my eye, and perhaps it's, perhaps it's not. I imagine it takes more skill than I have to create, but it, uh, it doesn't necessarily have the same level of refinement, and I wouldn't necessarily expect to see that in, in something of a refined example. I thought the engraving would be more detailed, um, and there are likely examples with more detailed engravings and things like that. Anyway, this one has engravings on either side of the blade, and they're, they're interesting to, to say the least. I just, I don't really know much about what they're saying or the story, and I'm sure there's some historical reference to it, only that the the overall craftsmanship on the on the engravings themselves, I thought, was not uh, not as refined as pieces that I've seen from from earlier periods or 
over the same period. The handle was also interesting, or the grip itself, I should say, uh, in that it had this kind of spindled shape, um, and the, the wires running in the spindle were recessed so that they didn't catch on your hand, and they held the, the shark or ray skin down, I'm not exactly sure. And then there are bound wire made, or kind of braided wires in like a turf's head style knot. And what I found interesting about it is that it's lacquered or, or held together with some sort of substance that makes it really smooth in the hand. Um, none of it is grabby, or if you if you wear a glove, presumably it works fine, but none of it pokes you or, or anything like that. It's really a well-thought-out handle. It's very easy to index, and none of the wires kind of jet out. And a lot of the mass reproduction stuff, the, the time isn't taken to secure these wires, and they start to come undone over time. So even though this may not be the original grip uh, on this sword, it could certainly have been replaced over time. It's definitely old, or perhaps period, to, it would be a better word to say, and it has, it has stood the test of time through many people groping it at various sword-related exhibitions that the Oakshot Institute puts on. Anyway, I thought it was very interesting looking handle. The other bit was the pommel on the um, on the broadsword, and and in that sense I just like that the the kind of basket was screwed on. Um, it looked like to, to be affixed with these kind of handmade screws, and it reminded me a little bit of like a, a diver's helmet or something like that, but just wasn't what I expected to see. Um, I, I don't know what to make of it, but I, I certainly found it to be an interesting bit. The other bit was where the broadsword hilt met the blade. Now, very often I hear that medieval swords didn't necessarily have the same level of refinement as, you know, say an Albion would today, which is made on a CNC mill and out of patterns and all of that type of stuff. This one didn't have a gap, I suppose, is the main thing that I'm, I'm drawing my eye to, and that I didn't see a gap between the blade and the cross guard area or the guard area and that is something that isn't consistent on all of the examples though a lot of the european medieval pieces that i see in museums or in in books and such have have some degree of of gap more than i suppose is is acceptable to some folks in a modern reproduction standpoint anyway it's, it's inter interesting to see this kind of handmade object have really refined tolerances around the grip something that or around the where the blade meets the the cross and uh, not to say it means anything or makes it work better, just a, a detail that I use as a modern reproduction sword enthusiast to determine, you know, the overall attention to detail, you might say. One detail that I like to see very, very tight tolerances on and very little gap around. So to see it in a historic blade, my main point is that I thought that was interesting. The next two blades were a rapier, and the first one that I'm going to show you is one that I got to spend a little bit more time with. Um, though not necessarily enough because it was it was definitely the doll of the party a very beautiful sword it had this very intricate kind of um, ribbed guard section with kind of a shell looking hilt anyway there are some interesting pieces to digest about this particular rapier hilt in that one uh, the little clamshell areas the top part is actually screwed on which is something that I, I found kind of interesting and they said that um, that part might see a lot of wear depending on your fencing style or whether so perhaps that that component of the guard is made to be screwed on and off so it can be replaced easily enough or maybe it was retrofitted on it's it's tough to, to say I guess I, I don't know the the details around it but the other bit I found interesting about the hilt was the geometry of the rib cage area and how uh, basically it's, it's tapered in such a way that a blade should kind of glance off each one of those rib cage areas so it it provides structure because it's it's pretty thickly uh, it's pretty thick steel wire type stuff there and so if you had a, a slash to the hand it could certainly protect it more than just a piece of sheet metal would if it were made similarly to that kind of clamshell piece um, but if you had a thrust go directly to your hand it would likely glance off the way that that rib cage is is structured it would it would kind of bounce off it doesn't allow the sword to kind of anyway I'm rambling here I like the design and geometry of that that overall sword it appears to have a lot of thought the other bit that I noted was the grip and it's an octagonal grip and again this may be an example of a grip that was replaced sometime but the grip is I was told from from the period of the general construction of the sword and for a wire grip um, one it's octagonal in shape I didn't find it particularly difficult to index, but none of these swords I'm swinging around or, or anything like that. I get the chance to hold them with one hand upright for a little bit and kind of twirl them around a little bit, but very gingerly, you might say, uh, given their, their historic value and whatnot. I, and 
in the room that I'm in, I, I don't get a chance to really play with them per se, but uh, I can hold them, feel the balance, and, and overall the, the grip I, I thought was very comfortable and easy to index, particularly if you put your finger above where the, uh, the cross is, it certainly rests in your hand in a way where you can find the edge really quickly. Uh, the blade, however, had some engravings and other bits and bobs in it, but I didn't find it to be a particularly refined blade. Perhaps the blade was replaced? I'm, I'm not exactly sure. The next example was a another uh, rapier style, and I can't remember which one was newer and which one was older. Shows how much I was paying attention to the lecture. Anyway, the this one was, you know, uh, not something I got to spend a whole lot of time with, but I did like the grip, and in this case, it's, it's interesting to me just how light the sword was. So the pommel was uh, quite large, and I don't think it was hollow, but the overall presence of this, this hilt was very... Uh, very delicate, I would say. So if it, if it had hard strikes, I think it would need to be fixed or replaced or, or something like that. It's not something that would take beatings or, and not the, to say that it should. That's not, not the point that I'm going to. But I think from a modern context, we think that these swords were made and they should just last in their, you know, in their, in their construction. That they should take a pounding and last forever. And that's not necessarily what the, the swords of the historical period that many of the reproductions we purchase today are, are trying to emulate. Uh, it's not, not the performance that they did in the olden days. If you were to, you know, have a hard hit from a, um, some sort of object on this hilt, it would likely deform and need to be repaired or replaced, um, especially after, after a couple instances of such abuse. Anyway, this sword, I, I thought it was, it was very delicate feeling, very easy to move around. Uh, lighter than other equivalent arms and armor style rapiers that I've I've held. Very often I hold modern reproduction rapiers and they tend to be, you know, three or four pounds. They're not light uh, blades and they're not unsturdy. They feel like you could cut or thrust and while they might be more thrust centric, it certainly seems like you could punch somebody in the face with a hilt a lot of times. This felt like a, a more dainty weapon in, in my hand. I, I certainly didn't put that to the test, but Nevertheless, on with the next one. Uh, the next one was, was one that did not receive a ton of attention. It certainly got some attention, but it was, it was kind of the wallflower, if you will, so I got a little more chance to take pictures without people's hands on it. And again, one thing I noted about this particular sword was uh, some things that were pretty high quality. So the, again, the cross guard area where the blade met the cross guard, there was very little gap in there, and I thought that that was interesting again here's another sword from a you know, medieval period that doesn't have uh, a whole lot of gap in the in the uh, cross guard where the cross guard meets the blade it has some the other bit i noted was overall general lack of symmetry there's some things stylistically that appear semi-symmetrical but there there's certainly an asymmetry overall to it and on top of that just the the way like fullers terminate the location of the fullers seems a lot less refined overall they terminate in different places and different spots and um, I imagine it, it, it feels actually pretty good in the hand. I imagine somebody thought about how it should feel at some point, and, and it's tough for me to say how diminished the sword is from its original condition and what those, uh, how it's been diminished over time may impact how it felt originally. Nevertheless, it still feels very light, and that's consistent through pretty much all the swords that I got to feel uh, in this exhibition, in, in that all of them felt much lighter than you would expect them to, and much lighter than most modern reproductions do. Anyway, the tolerance around the grip, as well as the location of the fuller, is just kind of how, even though this is uh, this particular sword was an example of a wealthy man's sword, perhaps, it was still kind of rough around the edges, you might say, and some of the things that I harp on today in modern reproduction specialists or modern reproduction swords, uh, I harp on things not getting right, They're, they may be more closely representing the historical version of the sword they're trying to emulate than if they were to make it perfect. The last sword is one that I've only gotten a chance to see previously. I've, I've gotten to see Arms and Armor's reproduction of this at Renaissance Festival. So they make a version that is similar to this in their in their assortment of swords, and I've gotten a, to hold a, a version like that. And unfortunately, I don't recall a whole lot about how that felt. But this one right here, this uh, this old sword, feels remarkably light. The hollow ground is, is quite deep, and despite its size, you might expect it to feel um, a little more cumbersome in the hand. It does not. It is very elegant feeling, uh, very easy to, to move around. And overall, the construction on it is, is certainly diminished. It apparently used to have a silver guard on it, and the, the silver has faded. But uh, one other bit I found interesting, I know I'm, I keep going back to the, where the cross guard and blade meet. This one had another interesting facet, and in that the ricasso kind of swells out, so the hollow ground doesn't extend into the 
uh, into into the cross guard, it kind of stops and bolsters uh, in the this little narrow ricasso section right where the blade meets. There are also some some there's some degradation around there. You can see some spots where it may have had a little extra space around uh, around the blade itself. But it's tough to say what the original original look would have been. Uh, given how diminished the the cross guard is from its from its original condition, but this sword was one in particular that was fun. The overall dimensions uh, made it very very lively in the hand. It would be interesting to see it put in the sword or the weapon dynamics computer. Uh, the grip has held up really well over time, though. Again, I don't know how old that is, and just the construction of the uh, of the blade itself, the hollow ground nature of it was was quite good, and it still had a pretty keen edge after so many years and, and all the layers of rust. Anyway, um, those are the five swords that I got to see and some interesting bits that I felt about the sword. The thing that was consistent around all five was that they were lighter than they appeared to be. Uh, they were more delicate, dainty objects than modern reproductions that represent them today are and that I imagine that has to do with companies selling them need them to be durable so that people don't return them and aren't disappointed in the product. But the initial pieces, these all felt like kind of dainty weapons where if you were to whack them into a tree branch, uh, they would probably bend, they might cut into it or cut through it, but heavy cutting against armor or something like that, or a really hard target, uh, it didn't seem like these were, were would hold up particularly well to really what, what amounts to abuse by today's standards. So and that was one thing that was consistent. The overall build quality was very interesting to see the lack of symmetry, but some of the refinement and dynamically just how how amazing they all felt in the hand. They felt like weapons and like you could move them around quite easily. Particularly the arming sword style blades. The rapiers had, had a feeling that uh, required perhaps a little bit more education before you could use it effectively. But the other arming swords in the group just felt like you could, you could hand it to somebody and say, go do what you need to do and they'd be able to figure it out. Anyway, um, again, links in the description down below to the Oakshot Institute. I hope the video was interesting. I certainly had a great time at the Shindig. If you have the chance to attend one, I couldn't recommend it more highly. And that's all I have for you. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.